Let us pray. May you strengthen us for the week to come, that in all things we may live as your dear children and give all glory to your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Divinely sure And trusting in its wisdom My faith shall rest secure Increase my faith, dear Savior For Satan seeks by night and day to rob me of this treasure and take my hope of bliss away. <coughs> Beside me I shall be undismayed and led by thy good spirit, I shall be unafraid. Abide with me, O Savior, a firmer faith be. Defiance to every evil foe. Faith, Lord, let me serve thee. No persecution, grief, and pain should seek to well me let me a steadfast trust retain and then at my departure take thou me home to thee Promise me in my 
life and death, Lord, keep me until thy heaven I gain. Please rise. We're following the order of Holy Communion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity Let us confess our sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto Thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended Thee, and justly deserved Thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called servant to the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Of him and through him and to him are all things. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Christ, O oh Lord God, Lamb. 
name of God, Son of the Father, and who takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Away the sin of the world, receive us. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have taught us to believe and confess your eternal Godhead as one God in three persons. We ask that you keep us in this faith and confession and defend us from everything that might endanger or destroy it. We pray in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The Old Testament lesson chosen for this, the Festival of Holy Trinity, is taken from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. We read out of chapter 18, verses 30 to 32. As parents, most of us know what it's like to be conflicted. On the one hand, we love our children. On the other, we know it's important that we correct them, lest they grow up to be spoiled brats who live in sin and in opposition to God's will. Our Heavenly Father is both loving and righteous. On the one hand, His justice demands retribution for sin. On the other, His mercy calls for repentance and pardon. God doesn't want sinners to be condemned, and so He has provided the solution in His Son. Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, Every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. So far the words of our Old Testament lesson for this morning. The epistle lesson is taken from the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians from the final chapter. We read a single verse, verse 14. This particular verse chosen because today is the festival of Holy Trinity in which we remember that our God has revealed himself in his word as one God, at the same time, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please rise. Join me in the gradual, the prayer of the day, as you find it printed in your bulletin. Praise to you, O Lord, creator of all. In your hands are the deep places of the earth. Praise to you, O Lord, the heavens declare your glory. The skies are the work of your hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise to you, O Lord, 
Enable us to praise and glorify you forever. Hallelujah. And the Gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel according to the Apostle Matthew. We read out of chapter 28, beginning at verse 18. Be to thee, o Lord. Jesus of Nazareth, the incarnate Son of God, also confirms the nature of God in the Great Commission, placing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit alongside one another as equals persons of the one God. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So far, the Gospel lesson. Speak to thee, O Christ. We continue our worship by together confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, which are printed on your hymn insert. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of Virgin Mary and was man and was crucified all for us under Ponch Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to scriptures and ascended to heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both quick and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin, and I look for resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. strive against 
my flesh and blood. Create in me a new heart, Lord, that gladly I obey thy word, not but what thou wilt desire, with such new life my soul inspire. Grant that I only thee may love. <coughs> Till I be Grace be unto you in peace from the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The word of God upon which we meditate this festival of Holy Trinity is taken from the Proverbs chapter 15, verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. These are the words. In the name of Jesus the Christ, whose blood cleanses us from all sin, dear fellow redeemed in his precious blood. One of my favorite comic strips is entitled Calvin and Hobbes. Those of you familiar with Calvin and Hobbes know that Calvin is a little blonde boy and Hobbes is his stuffed tiger. Like many young children, Calvin also carries on, often carries on, conversations with his stuffed tiger. On one occasion, Calvin asks Hobbes, Hobbes, do you think our morality is defined by our actions or by what's in our hearts? Wise old Cal, or Hobbes responds, I think our actions show what's in our hearts. After thinking about it and being condemned, Calvin responds, I resent that. The wise old tiger Hobbes had it exactly right. In fact, our Lord Jesus, long before Calvin and Hobbes were ever dreamt up, said as much when he explained that evil thoughts, words, and actions have their origin in a corrupt human mind. Jesus said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. As we walk with Jesus heavenward, we are going to have to contend with our sinful hearts and minds. We're going to have to daily contend with evil thoughts. Our Heavenly Father warns us about living with our thoughts, that is, of thinking that they are hidden from Him. He tells us that the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to Him, while the words of the pure are pleasant to Him. We're truly blessed to study and to learn from God's holy word. We pray that the Holy Spirit who inspired these words and gave them to Solomon to be written for our faith and soul's sake would bless and enlighten us through these words. Amen. Many, if not all, young boys go through what some would call the gross phase. During the gross phase, they do their best to produce animals and objects that gross out everyone. 
when I was a young man, that meant purchasing slime from a vending machine at the Kmart. We knew it was a rousing success when we showed it to our mother and she responded simply with, yuck, why would you buy that? What do you find truly detestable? The complete yuck. What would you refuse even to touch in a million years? If you can imagine such a thing, then you can begin to understand what an abomination is in the sight of God. An abomination is something that is detestable to God, something that he wouldn't touch, as it were, with a thousand-foot pole. In the Old Testament Scriptures, God himself tells us on a number of occasions exactly what he finds detestable. And when we look at these things, we find that they all have this in common, that they have the possibility of hurting his people. Those things that make his people physically or spiritually sick and lead to their death are called an abomination. For example, God said it was detestable to him and should be to them to eat certain animals that consumed rotting flesh and carried disease. Not hard to see why God would find that detestable. In the same way, the Lord also said that idolatry, human sacrifices, consulting fortune tellers, homosexuality, other sexual perversion, divorce, unjust business practices, lying, and all other sins were and still are detestable to him. Yuck. All of these things have the potential to turn us away from the Lord or at least to turn his face from us. And so the Lord plainly tells us in the Old Testament, these things my soul hates. Now there's a statement. Yuck. The ultimate yuck. Now all of these things in this list I just mentioned are visible and in some way observable. But a thing doesn't have to be visible and observable to be an abomination to the Lord. Because right here in Proverbs 15, the Lord tells us that even human thoughts are an abomination to him. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Yuck. But admittedly, we tend to think like young Calvin, right? That our thoughts are private, secret, hidden, and certainly not as bad as sinful actions. But this proverb reminds us that God knows even the thoughts that we think before we think them. We would all be ashamed and embarrassed if other people could read our thoughts. I would guess that we would be embarrassed most of the time if people knew our thoughts. But surely this phrase of the proverb isn't speaking of us, is it? It says that the thoughts, the ideas, the conclusions, the desires, the plans and schemes of the wicked are detestable to him. Are we wicked? As far as we still possess a sinful nature, we are indeed wicked. And it is, like Jesus said, that sinful thoughts proceed out of sinful hearts. And we all have one of those. It's not just that we have sinful thoughts. Sadly, we often feed and nurture those thoughts. We thoughtlessly subject ourselves to evil ideas and sinful thoughts. Sometimes we are to blame for putting them in our own minds. Oh, not me, Pastor. Not me. Oh, really? What kind of music do you listen to? What's the subject matter? Is it God-pleasing? Always? What do you watch on television and in movies? Do you watch programming that depicts what God calls sin, but it's depicted as just another natural choice for human beings? Do you watch programming that promotes greed and lust? If you could see the meat in the fridge, that it was rotten and it smelled terrible, would you still eat it? 
course not. Stupid. Why then, if we can see and hear evil, do we still subject ourselves to it? But it's not just what we put into our minds that affects the way we think and act, it's also those with whom we associate. When our friends and neighbors, our co-workers and associates, proudly speak of past sins that they have committed and those that they intend to commit in the future, evil thoughts are put into our minds. If those we associate are not concerned about their relationship with Jesus, will we be if we consort with them? The Lord warns us in 1 Corinthians, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. So here's the invisible elephant in the room. Why do we allow evil thoughts to be put into our minds? Why don't we see the evil and run from it? The answer is frightening and simple at the same time. We are corrupt. And so the Lord warns us, or has to warn us, that evil thoughts are detestable to our Heavenly Father. In fact, anything that would lead us away from our Lord Jesus is detestable to our God. And there are many such things. So what then can be done? Is this proverb recorded to give us a little boost to spur us on to greater heights, to move us to try and do better next time. If it were within our power to do so, that would be great. But it isn't. For our natural minds are opposed to God. God's own word says, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Isn't that evident in the fact that our natural inclination is not obedience, but disobedience. Or maybe that's just me. If it were possible for us to become good by our own will and power, then Christ died for nothing. If we sinful human beings could produce pure thoughts and deeds to please God, why did he send his son to live an innocent life on our behalf? If we could do it ourselves. If we could earn God's favor, why did he send his son to do it? Is there any comfort at all to be found in this proverb? Well, there's not a great deal of comfort to be found here. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. It's established that we're wicked. It's a truth we can't escape. But our hope rests on two words. The pure. In a kind of backhanded way, Solomon gives us hope by making known that there are some in whose hearts pure words reside and flow from. There must be some who are pure in the sight of God. Who are they? Ironically, it's the same people who are wicked by birth and nature. You see, the pure are those who have been purified, cleansed of sin by God himself. For unless God himself purifies the hearts of men by removing their sin, they cannot and they will not speak pure or pleasant words from the heart. In fact, we will ask the Lord to give us to produce in us pure thoughts at the close of the sermon. We do it every week when we sing the words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We're saying, Lord, unless you remove my sin for Jesus' sake, unless you purify my heart, I can only produce wicked thoughts and words. Give me a new guide, your spirit, your Holy Spirit, that he may lead me on your paths. And we know even then, hopefully at the end of the sermon, we know even then that God has heard our prayer. Our sins have been removed. Our hearts have been unburdened. For you see, it's Christ who cleanses us and makes us pure. 
Christ who declares us righteous in God's sight through faith in his living and dying. Christ who sends the Holy Spirit to sanctify and to purify our hearts through the words of sin forgiven. It is the Spirit of God who through the word fills our hearts with pure thoughts and pure words which we pass on to others. Pure words that have to do with our perfect and pure Savior, Jesus. He creates us anew within from the inside out, moving us to desire evil, not evil, but good. He gives us new life and produces in us pure thoughts and desires. But it's only the power of the cross that can move us to say in the face of temptation, how can I do this great evil and sin against God? If my Savior so loved me that he was willing to die for me, to be separated from his Father, and to suffer the pain of hell in order to remove my sin from me, why would I want to surround myself with the thoughts, with the words, with the friends that would lead me away from him? Instead, dear Lord, let this encouragement be my daily guide and prayer. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And let us also conclude by singing and asking the Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at Thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for Thee. Amen. And the peace of God, which far surpasses our human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> A clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. While there is no offering to be gathered by the ushers, we will continue with the offering hymn.
Holy, holy, holy is your name, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our hearts sing the praise of your name, dear Heavenly Father, for you are our creator and preserver. Especially do we remember your great love in sending your own Son and offering him up for our eternal redemption. Our hearts sing the praise of your name, dear Savior Jesus Christ. You loved us in suffering and dying for our sins on the cross. In you, the Son of God and Son of Man, we find hope, joy, and peace. Yes, eternal salvation. Our hearts sing the praise of your name, dear Holy Spirit, for you have re revealed God's truth to humankind and through it have called us to faith and forgiveness. Without your continual sanctifying work in us through the gospel, we could neither grow in our faith nor walk pleasing to God by keeping his commandments. O triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you now and forever for your marvelous works and for the undeserved love and mercy which you continually shower upon us. Hear us when we pray. Forgive our countless sins for the sake of him who has redeemed us. Forgive us for failing to worship and serve you as we ought to. Let your hand of blessing be open to all of us when we call upon you in truth. Nourish us with your word lest we become faint. Strengthen us lest we become weak. Cheer us lest we become depressed with the troubles of this life. Hold us up lest we stumble beneath the burdens that afflict us. Direct our physical and spiritual footsteps lest we falter and choose the wrong way. Bring us sweet relief from pain and illness. Where encouragement is needed by us, there apply the fitting word. When we need patience in bearing our crosses, teach us our Savior's own example of enduring suffering. Refresh our memories with all the good things you have continually done for us. Open our lips to praise you for them. Lead us daily to search your word, that we might be warned and instructed by its precepts, and our souls inspired with its message of divine grace and salvation. Be always near to us to guard us from sin and unbelief, so that the devil, the world, and our flesh may have no power over us. Yes, make us victorious Christians who are always faithful to your word, faithful to our calling, and faithful to you. Impart all needful blessings to our bodies and souls, and do not, on account of our sins, withhold your help from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the first four stanzas of hymn 400. Please rise. We'll continue with the order of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly fitting, proper, and spiritually beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. At this point, I ask you to get out your little uh, host and uh, wine with the wine on the bottom. Please tear off the top under which you'll find a small piece of unleavened bread. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Please turn it over. It won't spill. Peel the other side off. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. May this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ serve to strengthen you. May it preserve you in the one Christian faith to life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. Amen. We'll take a moment at this time to have the receptacles brought forward. If you'd like to drop your empty in there, please do so. We'll continue with the Nuctimidus. <laughs> According to thy word, thine 
eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A to lighten and the glory of thy people is royal. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this spiritual gift, and we pray that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Just a couple of announcements here. Of course, uh, we're going to try to continue with our worship next Sunday at the same time. And for the foreseeable future, we'll try to handle uh, the Lord's Supper the same way. If you want private communion, you can certainly speak to me beforehand. Um, obviously, the uh, COVID-19 thing, we're sick and tired of hearing about it. It's affected a lot of people, but uh, in the midst of this epidemic, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, um, there have been issues with uh, tropical storms, our brothers and sisters overseas. So if you can help with uh, that, there's, an in, there's a, a note here in the bulletin about kinship disaster relief. Apparently a number of our uh, 
fellow believers have lost uh, worship places and uh, the necessities of life, and you can help with that if you wish to. You know about the notifications and common sense requests. The CLC call news is there in the bulletin. Been a few changes, not too much. And the offerings from last Sunday are also listed there in the bulletin. Uh, daily Bible readings for home devotions are in the back of the bulletin. I encourage you to keep making use of those. Okay. I think that's it. Were you expecting another announcement of some kind? I could make something up. Okay. Lord be with you.